a small country of seven million people, has been a neutral nation since the Geneva Agreement of 1954. American policy since then has been to scrupulously respect the neutrality of the Cambodian people. A year earlier, in March 1969, US President Richard Nixon had authorized a secret bombing campaign of neutral Cambodia. When the bombs come, you have no warning. Not with the B-52s, you don't hear them, they're too high. The bombing signaled the start of a decade of unrelenting horror in which one quarter of the population of Cambodia would perish. I'm opposed to the bombing. I think it's wasteful, immoral, unnecessary, ineffective, and illegal. For the most powerful nations on Earth, war was part of a game of domination that was played on a global scale. To the United States, Cambodia was just another piece in this game. The tragedy that would engulf Cambodia and claim an estimated two million lives was a direct result of American idealism gone wrong. There's a lot of dead bodies on the hands of the United States government. When you survey American foreign policy in the 20th century, I think Cambodia is a low point in American diplomacy. Even worse, the United States was close to committing genocide there. The descent to this low point had in fact begun from the highest of ideals. In August 1941, the United States and Britain announced a joint statement of principles about the kind of world they wanted to see. Known as the Atlantic Charter, it included a declaration of the right of all nations to dwell in safety within their own boundaries, living out their lives in freedom from fear and want. This was one of the principles that the United States fought for in the Second World War. At the end of the war, the United Nations was formed to realize the hopes expressed in the Atlantic Charter Declaration. The first major challenge to the stability of the newly formed organization was the rise of communism. Massive changes were occurring in Asia. By the end of 1949, China was communist, and France at war against a communist independence movement in its Indo-Chinese colony of Vietnam. Nineteen fifty saw the first violent confrontation of the Cold War. Following an invasion of South Korea by communist North Korea, the United Nations intervened militarily under American command. The Americans now became obsessed with what became known as the domino theory. You have a row of dominoes set up and you knock over the first one and uh, what will happen to the last one is uh, the certainty that it'll go over uh, very quickly. Proposed by President Eisenhower, the theory attempted to simplify an increasingly complex world for the American public. It was to be the backbone of American policy in Southeast Asia for the next four decades. If Indochina falls, Thailand is put in almost impossible position. The same is true of Malaya with its rubber and tin. The same is true of Indonesia. If this whole part of Southeast Asia goes under communist domination or communist influence, Japan must inevitably be oriented toward the communist regime. While the struggle in Vietnam escalated, its neighbor Cambodia had gained independence from the French without bloodshed. This was largely due to the talent of its mercurial leader, King Norodom Sihanouk. He was to be the central figure in Cambodia's destiny for the next six decades. <laughs> 
1941, at the age of 19, Sihanouk had been installed as king by the French. I was uh, chosen by Marshal Pétain to be king of Cambodia because uh, the French uh, believed that I uh, would be a very, very flexible uh, king, uh, very pro-French, uh, uh, willing to let Cambodia remain as a colony of France. But the French were wrong when they thought they could manipulate the new king. In 1953, displaying a remarkable talent for statesmanship, Sihanouk won independence from the French and became father to his people. But soon Sihanouk was to exhibit a darker side. He thought he was the only source of power and he resented any competition, any rivalry, any, uh, anybody with, a, with a, an appeal and uh, he thought everybody was a kind of threat. Uh, maybe because he felt somehow insecure, but uh, he was a tyrannic uh, person. He wanted to be the uh, overlord. He was the overlord in the view of the people. The traditional way to address the king is something like, uh, I am the dust under your foot. You, know, and you are the master of my existence. And, and all that uh, kind of uh, way of speaking was, was really meaning something. Two years later, Sihanouk also demonstrated an aptitude for playing the political game. In 1955, he abdicated in favour of his father and took the title Prince. To his people, he became affectionately known as Prince Papa. Forming his own political party, he promptly won all the seats in the country's first election. He uh, was uh, really changeable. He changed his mind uh, easily and uh, he has the character of uh, a Machiavell Machiavellian prince. You see. Uh, he, uh, in the Cold War era, he was trying to uh, you know, uh, play off one power against another. Cambodia had emerged as an independent nation in a troubled region. Vietnam had just been divided into a communist north and a democratic south, and the two countries were now at war. When President Eisenhower's Secretary of State, John Foster Dulles, told the young prince that all countries, even new ones, had to choose sides in the Cold War, the prince disagreed. Your neutrality is uh, foolish, uh, Foster Dulles told me. Uh, in, in our world, you have to choose between the free world and the communist world. And please choose. Don't say that you are neutral. I say, I repeat that I am neutral. Cambodia itself had a sizable Vietnamese population. But centuries of antagonism had created a legacy of deep-seated distrust between the two peoples. The last thing the new country wanted was to become embroiled in its neighbors' internal conflicts. But during the Cold War, neutrality was a dangerous game. From 1961 on, succeeding US presidents Kennedy and Johnson had gradually increased American involvement in South Vietnam. Sihanouk had already made a decision about the outcome of this conflict. He was quite convinced that the Americans, like the French, would lose the war in Vietnam and that that would leave Cambodia exposed to uh, the, the wrath of the communist countries and to Vietnam once the Americans moved out of the area. Sihanouk made it clear to the Americans that their interference was not welcome in Southeast Asia. In 1965, the United States responded by closing its embassy in Phnom Penh. Sihanouk began courting a powerful new friend. He was leaning further and further toward the uh, socialist camp, especially toward China, you see. And then uh, 
uh, uh, China uh, uh, had begun uh, uh, its assistance, uh, uh, economic assistance, and then to increase uh, its assistance afterwards, you see. Internationally, the political map was being transformed. In the early 1960s, the worldwide decline of colonialism meant that membership of the United Nations had grown rapidly with the influx of new African and Asian nations. Despite America's support for these nations, they were anything but grateful and often vigorously opposed US policy. Disillusioned, the United States decided to ignore the United Nations and set its own agenda in Vietnam. By the end of 1965, the United States had increased its military forces in South Vietnam by more than 100,000. This forced many of the communists to seek sanctuary over the border in neutral Cambodia. For Sihanouk, this meant the very real danger of being dragged into the war. He's scared of the Vietnamese, and he felt that the only way he could uh, alleviate what, uh, or lessen what the Vietnamese might do to Cambodia when and if they won the war, he was pretty sure they would win the war, was to make deals with them and to ally himself with them in order to save his own uh, regime, uh, save Cambodia's independence, and so on. He was, uh, he was supping with the devil, but what else could he have done? I do not hate the, the United States, but by opportunism, by patriotism, I had to help the North Vietnamese, and I got their promise to respect always Cambodia as an independent state, a neutral state, non-aligned state, without any interference in our internal affairs from Vietnam. Both sides in the Cold War were raising the stakes in Vietnam. The Soviet Union and China were increasing their flow of arms and ammunition to the communist forces. Reassured by his relationship with the Chinese, Sihanouk now took a major risk. He would let them bring in supplies and transport weapons through Cambodia. We saw the uh, David Cong De and North Vietnamese troops move in. Uh, but the number at that time is not many. No, they are very good friends with the people, you know. They come and help people like uh, plants dry, harvesting, carry water and all that. Yeah, they are very good. Probably they train to be good uh, discipline and be friendship with the people. Using Cambodia's neutrality as protection, the Viet Cong and North Vietnamese were attacking and killing Americans in South Vietnam. Infuriated, the United States military formulated a plan to attack the sanctuaries in Cambodia. My advice to Washington was not to take military action against Cambodia. Not to bring the war to Cambodia, not to invade Cambodia, not to try to get rid of Sihanouk. Since the closure of the American embassy, the Australian ambassador, Noel Deschamps, had acted as the representative of the United States in Cambodia. I believe that if any of these things were done, it would bring disaster to Cambodia without in any way helping the United States win the war. And in fact, uh, for the whole four years of Johnson's presidency, that advice was followed. President Lyndon Johnson steadfastly refused to allow the military to act against Cambodia because, despite the presence of the North Vietnamese sanctuaries, he still considered it a neutral country. But that was about to change. In late 1968, America had elected a new president. Richard Nixon, one of the key advocates of the domino theory in the 1950s, had won office on the platform of ending the United States' involvement in the Vietnam War. With his newly appointed national security advisor, Henry Kissinger, Nixon immediately adopted the American military's plan to destroy the North Vietnamese sanctuaries in Cambodia. In March 1969, just eight weeks after coming to office, Nixon gave the order for the covert bombing of Cambodia to begin. <laughs> 
i was one of the first civilian to learn about the bombing of cambodia it was early march one nine hundred sixty nine i wandered into the photo interpretation shop of mac v and an enlisted man who was a photo interpreter said hey come on over here and take a look at this he says we have a track here we tried to bomb the, fr the headquarters of the first north vietnamese army division which was seven kilometers inside Cambodia. Well, I was absolutely astonished and appalled. I said, we did what? Because it was absolutely against our policy to bomb Cambodia. The bombing would be cloaked in the deepest secrecy. The White House knew that this would be regarded as an act of war against a neutral country. Air Force records were altered to remove all traces of the bombing and its approval from the history of the war. I guess they uh, felt in large measure it could be justified that the communist side had violated Cambodia's neutrality and they were fair game that when the truth uh, came out eventually they might be able to justify it. Later Kissinger would defend the action. Cambodia was embroiled. It is an absurdity to say that a country can occupy a part of another country, kill your people, and that then you are violating its neutrality when you respond against the foreign troops that are on that neutral territory. It is total hypocrisy. For his part, Sihanouk took a pragmatic view of the situation. Just three months after the secret bombing campaign began, full diplomatic relations between Cambodia and the United States were re-established. The quid pro quo for reopening diplomatic uh, relations with uh, Cambodia would have to have been the secret bombing. It seems to me that Sihanouk uh, knew about the secret bombing, gave, and, it, and he's made many statements more or less to this effect, that he gave the Americans permission to bomb uh, his, you know, his Cambodian territory. Sihanouk had expected a massive injection of American aid. This failed to materialize. Sihanouk was struggling. The fact that he wasn't delivering economically, that Cambodia was slipping backwards quite rapidly, uh, was building a lot of resentment at home. Firstly, in the army, he didn't have enough to actually give uniforms to the army or pay them properly. Uh, they felt belittled. Um, secondly, with the student population especially, because they didn't get jobs. There's the feeling, this, this strong feeling of, of longing for change longing to take on responsibility by yourself, it pervading the, the, you know, the community in the capital city, particularly in Phnom Penh. In March 1970, while Sihanouk was traveling overseas, Phnom Penh saw the first public demonstrations against the prince's rule. Events came to a head on the 18th of March. Lon Nol, Sihanouk's hand-picked prime minister and a general in the Cambodian army, led a coup that overthrew the prince. Lon Nol uh, had been a confidant of U.S. officials uh, in the military and uh, among civilians. They had been in close contact with him for a long time. Uh, they they had 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 offered support to him, and he had he had asked for support. There were all kinds of connections. There's no smoking gun in the, in the sense of the U.S. saying explicitly to Lon Nol, "You go and overthrow Sihanouk." But the, the circumstantial evidence is quite uh, extensive. Obviously, he, he had American backing. Because he, he, he was not a person who would have staged a coup d'etat without, unless he'd had some kind of assurances from somewhere. And where else? The overthrow of Sihanouk in March 1970 is the absolute turning point for Cambodia's destiny. Up until then, uh, it, was, it was going downhill, uh, life was not what all Cambodians wanted by a long shot, but it was basically at peace. From then on, it was downhill. For Sihanouk, a descendant of the ancient Cambodian kings, being deposed by his subjects was incomprehensible. Sihanouk was not prepared to relinquish control over his Cambodia. His next decision 
would have unforeseeable and horrific consequences. Taking up a Chinese offer of assistance, Sihanouk was persuaded to form a government in exile, known as the National United Front of Kampuchea. He immediately broadcast an impassioned declaration of war, calling for the Cambodian people to take arms against the Lon Nol government. During that time, a lot of argument between people in the village, student, ordinary people, teacher, among uh, um, government employees and all that about what's it called the, at that time the coup d'etat and some uh, support Lonol and some support uh, King. Sihanouk's United Front not only included the North Vietnamese but also the little-known Cambodian Communist Party, the Khmer Rouge. In March 1970, Pol Pot's Khmer Rouge were nothing. Uh, Sihanouk had seen to it that way. He had undermined the communist side. Uh, this was very astute politics. Uh, we can, we can criticise Sihanouk for all sorts of things, but he totally compromised the Cambodian communist movement, mainly by his alliance with China. They wouldn't back the Cambodian communists. Uh, they were a piddling little force. For the Khmer Rouge, this was their first step towards power, as Sihanouk's call to arms electrified the countryside. Thousands of peasants joined the communists to help Prince Papa drive out Lon Nol's government and their American allies. When Sihanouk decided to form this United Front, it gave them an alliance with the Vietnamese, it openly aligned with Sihanouk. This gave them access to arms, training, uh, uh, personnel, all sorts of stuff that they had not had before. Uh, but over the next two or three years, they develop into an efficient, uh, well-armed, uh, uh, pretty large uh, 40,000, 50,000 men uh, fighting force. Uh, that could not have been done without this. It, it all flowed from that alliance that, which flowed from the coup. While Sihanouk was rallying the countryside, in the cities, Lon Nol was rallying popular support for the expulsion of the Vietnamese from their sanctuaries. In the ensuing confusion, atrocities were committed against the Vietnamese who had lived in Cambodia for generations. While thousands of innocent Vietnamese were killed, ancient traditions of warfare would dictate a more gruesome fate for enemy soldiers. Culturally, there were great gaps between the Western perceptions of what was acceptable and Cambodian ideas of what was acceptable. When we had film of Cambodians cutting open uh, bodies and ripping out the liver and eating them, Western opinion was pretty shocked by the Lon Nol forces doing that. But this is what Cambodians are doing, were doing by tradition. Uh, it is said that it's getting the spirit, the strength of your enemy. Uh, it's a, a ritual. Quite frequently in the early years of the war, as a mark of friendship, they would ask you to come and join them in eating the liver of, of, of the dead. On one occasion, I was having lunch with the governor of one of the provinces and out on the lawn in front of the governor's residence, there were all these uh, so-called Viet Cong bodies, corpses laid out, all of them slashed open and the liver taken out, and a truck arrived and they started tossing these dead bodies onto the truck. Uh, it, it was not very appetizing. On April the 30th, just six weeks after the coup, American and South Vietnamese troops crossed Cambodia's eastern frontier. In cooperation with the armed forces of South Vietnam, attacks are being launched this week to clean out major enemy sanctuaries on the Cambodian-Vietnam border. The purpose was to destroy the communist headquarters that the American military believed to be coordinating the war in South Vietnam. We take this action not for the purpose of expanding the war into Cambodia, but for the purpose of ending the war in Vietnam. Nixon was convinced that with the communist control center destroyed, South Vietnam's security would be assured. The United States could then complete its planned pullout from Southeast Asia with its dignity intact. This is not an invasion of Cambodia. 
might know that the uh, gun and artillery and selling, you know, they don't know you are innocent people or you are the Viet Cong, you know, they kill everyone. Into my village, uh, my neighbor house were burning and killed the people, injured the people, but uh, you can do nothing. Bọn nhâm chăm thà nhâm rút mũi dây hay nâng mi nhâm bà nè Bọn nè có thu chương nhóm á Dây rút dư bếch nhâm bà lên dây rút tớ rút mũi dây con dây tớ tớ ngọt nha tớ Bọn tớ khơi nhâm chạc bánh chăng 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 Cô bà khó chạy tớ đánh bánh nha rút cổ chạy tớ mau bì khó dư Cô nó dư chạy tớ rút tớ mốc á Đó sẽ tớ đo là hùa phù nghiệp xế nhâm rút khuôn Nhâm rút khuôn bà lâm lãng tớ lập in the United States, Nixon's decision would also have tragic repercussions as suspicions over his motives quickly turned to widespread outrage. Barely concealing his contempt, Nixon dismissed the protesters. You know, you see these bums, you know, blowing up the campuses. Listen, the boys that are on the college campuses today are the luckiest people in the world. Less than a week after the incursion, during a demonstration at Kent State University, four students were shot dead by panicked National Guardsmen. It is no coincidence that the age of campus unrest coincides almost precisely with the escalation of American involvement in Vietnam. It is no coincidence that the killings at Kent State came hard on the heels of our invasion of Cambodia. I can now state that this has been the most successful operation of this long and very difficult war. I frankly think that Nixon was quite courageous in taking that action. And I know it was not the popular thing to do. It's not even popular for me to say it here 30 years later. But it, uh, he was protecting American forces, and uh, it worked. In fact, Nixon's main objective, the communist headquarters, was never found let alone destroyed. I think the Americans were deluded a bit about this idea of a central military headquarters. And of course, the Vietnamese never had such a, a thing where they would centralize everything. They, they were working in the kind of networking of commanding places and moving all the time. In the United States, Nixon's actions were causing grave concerns. Congress wanted to reign in the president. As to stopping the use of our own forces, we can do it by prohibiting the use of funds, by denying funds. That's the constitutional authority we have. Even though the American military withdrew after 60 days, Congress legislated to prohibit the further use of US ground forces in Cambodia. This action amounted to the first restriction of an American president's powers during war. For Cambodia, Nixon's decision to invade had only succeeded in engulfing the country in war. The Americans made a, a mistake. They were pushing, uh, forcing the uh, Northern Viet Cong troops to move quick inside the country. Once the, the Allied forces came charging across, they just swept the Vietnamese deeper into Cambodia and spread the war, spread it uh, to Cambodia's uh, great sorrow. The Americans also failed to comprehend that their invasion would unleash a wave of brutal atrocities by their allies against innocent Cambodian villagers. นั่นนั่นก็มีแน่บ่าที่กีคลาดสหายจึงเยอะกองติดเยอะกองแม่นจึงยิงตะซาเวก็มันได้เวมันได้เลยท่าถือไอ้อบัญชีชุนภัยค
Pushed ever deeper into Cambodian territory by the American incursion, the North Vietnamese and Viet Cong, with their Cambodian communist allies, the Khmer Rouge, launched an offensive against Lom Nol's forces. This is a country uh, which is defending its sovereignty against outside aggression. Emery Kobe Swank was the first American ambassador to Cambodia since the re-establishment of diplomatic ties. They have asked for our help, and I think it is a part of what we are calling the Nixon Doctrine, that we help people help themselves, help people to defend themselves. That's what the program here is all about. Cambodia is the Nixon Doctrine in its purest form. Because in Cambodia, what we are doing is helping the Cambodians to help themselves. Nixon called it the Nixon Doctrine in its purest form because uh, it can be two ways. I mean, it's either the darkest way to read it is that America had no stake in a place where there was no American lives at risk and no American interests at stake. That's a dark reading. A positive reading is we weren't paying any costs for something that was helpful to us in, in our Vietnam War. Here we are in the middle of a war with Vietnam, one that was not clearly defined. We're not sure what we're doing there. Nixon comes in and decides that uh, we're going to have a new Vietnamization program, slowly get peace with honor and bring American troops home. And what do we do? We, we in engage in an incursion in Laos and Cambodia and do a reckless bombing campaign in which virtually hundreds of thousands of people die at the hands of the United States, at the hands of Nixon and Henry Kissinger. And there's some good things to say about Kissinger-Nixon foreign policy, but Cambodia is not one of them. The Americans is following the agenda, which is nothing, not necessarily have anything to do with Cambodia's interests. In fact, the American was in disengaging. The American, in fact, is packing up to go home, starting from 68. And we did not know that. In fact, we are joining the Vietnam War at the wrong time. Frustrated by Congress's restrictions on the use of ground troops, the Americans stepped up the supply of arms and equipment to Lon Nol's forces. Despite this, they were no match for the battle-hardened North Vietnamese and Viet Cong. When this became clear, Nixon responded by intensifying the strategic bombing campaign. With little accountability over targets, the country became a free-fire zone. 